because he's always too slow to act. He is a disgrace order. and he should go Senator without Watt, another day in the office. Time has expired. We move to questions without notice. And I understand I'm going to Senator Wong remotely. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Afghans who worked with the ADF are reporting that their applications for safe haven have been rejected because they did not apply within six months of ending employment. How many Afghans who stood side by side with Australian troops have had their applications for safe haven rejected because they did not apply within six months of ending employment? Given that the Taliban won't check the date of employment, will this policy be revised? And will those who didn't apply within the six months have their applications reconsidered? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Wong for her questions. Uh, I've seen certain uh, certain media reports or suggestions, uh, but in relation to some of the matters that Senator Wong raises, I'm not uh, convinced that these are all accurate reflections of circumstance. Australian officials have worked very hard uh, to process applications through the Department of Defence, through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, to ensure uh, that those who have been locally engaged staff uh, supporting Australia's engagement in Afghanistan over a long period of time uh, are given uh, the acknowledgement uh, and the pathway to securing a visa. On the ground in Afghanistan right now and over recent days, uh, our officials have been working hard to equally ensure that visas are issued in emergency situations and to quickly uh, expedite arrangements to guarantee that those who need that safe passage who have got through uh, to uh, the airport in Kabul are able to be airlifted with a visa to be supported in their repatriation to Australia. And that's what's enabled us, Mr President, to, uh, to now uh, have seen over 1,600 people uh, evacuated from Afghanistan uh, through Australia's efforts and working with the UK and others just since the 18th of August. This builds on the hundreds uh, of repatriations that we have supported uh, over recent months uh, and indeed the many more that we have supported since uh, as a country we put in place special visa arrangements and plans to be able to assist those uh, to leave Afghanistan safely. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Those the Australian government has instructed to travel to the Hamid Karzai International Airport have faced a perilous journey, some having to wade through a sewer only to be then refused entry despite having relevant documentation. The United States, Canada, Germany and New Zealand are working beyond the airport to evacuate citizens and Afghans. Is Australia going to do the same? And if not, why not? Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Australia has been working closely with partner countries such as those Senator Wong has mentioned. Uh, to be able to try to access and provide assistance uh, beyond the airport perimeter uh, to individuals where that is possible. But nobody should underestimate the difficulty in relation to the perimeter of the airport and the challenging circumstances that not just Australian troops and personnel and individuals face, uh, but also, of course, all of those seeking to ensure uh, an orderly process that enables flights to be able to move uh, at such speed in and out of the international airport at Kabul. That does require security into the airport. It does require checks and processes. Australian officials are not in charge of every one of those checks and processes as to who gets entry into the airport, uh, but we continue to work closely with those partner countries to try to ensure that anybody, Australian citizen, Australian visa holder, Australian permanent resident, or those with a connection to any of the aforementioned Order, right to get access and to get Senator, support to learn. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Is there a deadline for the evacuation of Australians and Australian visa holders from Afghanistan? Has Mr Morrison spoken as yet to President Biden about arrangements to ensure the evacuation of these Australians and those Afghans who helped us before any such deadline? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the deadline is to action everything with the utmost of urgency right now. And that's why we're seeing multiple flights run in and out of Kabul, airlifting people out each and every day at present. 
Uh, and I pay thanks once again uh, to the Defence Force personnel, the Foreign Affairs, the Home Affairs personnel, uh, all of whom are in difficult, challenging and indeed dangerous circumstances, uh, helping to expedite and undertake that very important work. Uh, as the Prime Minister has said, uh, if the deadline for departures that uh, the United States has spoken of is pushed out, uh, then he has made it clear uh, to the United States that we support that. Our government has made it clear uh, and indeed we will continue to support all operations as long as they are safe and feasible and to be able to help people leave Kabul, leave Afghanistan, especially those uh, who have worked alongside us uh, and will continue to do all we can in terms of giving that assistance that's seen more than 1,600 leave Order. in the last Senator few days Birmingham. alone. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister update the Senate on Australia's vaccination rollout to combat the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister representing the Minister for Health. Order. Order. Can we at least, before we start being disorderly, can we at least allow the Minister to get to his feet? Senator Watt. Senator, and again, I'm going to ask Senators for the courtesy of all those Senators participating remotely. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you to Senator Chandler for the question. Mr President, Australia's COVID-19 vaccine rollout continues to expand. To date, more than 17.4 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered in Australia. We had a record Senator Sunday Polly. with more than 139,000 vaccines administered and 335,000 vaccines Order. administered over the weekend, Mr Order. President. Yesterday, Mr President, was a record Monday. Order. Senator, Senator Colbeck, than... please stop, stop the clock. The interjection started two seconds into his answer. Now, while there is a place for interaction across the chamber, some courtesy so that those remotely can actually hear would be appreciated. I'm having trouble hearing the minister, and it's very hard to tell who's interjecting unless they have a very recognisable voice. Senator Watt. <laughs> Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Yesterday was a record Monday, with more than 289,000 doses administered. That is good news for Australians and good news for the country, Mr President. About the only ones barracking against this rollout are on the other side of the chamber, Mr President. In the last seven days, more than 1.8 million doses have been administered into the arms of Australians. And in the last 30 days, Mr President, 6.3 million doses. The vaccine rollout is ramping up as we always said it would, Mr President. In our home state of Tasmania, Order. Senator Chandler, more than 414,000 doses have been given to those who have stepped up forward to protect themselves, protect friends, protect their families and protect their country, Mr President. Every vaccine helps protect each one of us, but every vaccine helps protect us all. We have now had a national, we, we now have national vaccination rates of more than 54 per cent for first doses, Mr President, with a, amongst the eligible population at over 30 per cent with second doses, Mr Order. President. Perhaps most significantly amongst our most vulnerable Australians, in, which, which is why we are seeing a difference in New South Wales this year compared to Victoria last year, over 50s, over 75 per cent first dose and over 70s, Order, over 85 per cent, Mr expired. Order. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, could you inform the Senate how people are accessing the vaccine across the nation? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Can I thank, can I thank all those involved in the rollout of vaccines across Australia, particularly the frontline healthcare workers, Order. for their commitment and hard work in getting this most important job done? We have enlisted GPs, Commonwealth vaccination clinics, Senator Aboriginal Watt. community health centres and pharmacies to deliver the vaccines into the arms of people right across the country, Mr. President. Over 8,100 points of presence around the country to get a jab. This week, 2,595 pharmacy sites were active and vaccinating nationally. By the end of this week, Mr. President, it will be 2,850 pharmacies across the country will have received doses 
and able to vaccinate next week, Mr. President. And more importantly, more than 900 of those are in New South Wales, including in the greater Sydney hotspot areas. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. That is great news, Minister. What advice is there for Australians who are yet to roll up their sleeve? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. The sooner more than the sooner Australians turn up at one of the more than 8,100 sites across the country, the sooner Order. we will be able to return to a normal life with res less restrictions and less lockdowns, Mr. President. As the Prime Minister has said, the national plan that we have developed and agreed with the states is our pathway to living with the virus. That is our goal, Mr. President, to live with the virus, not to live in fear of it, Mr. President. It's a plan based on the best possible Order. scientific evidence. Order, Undermined Senator only Polly. by those opposite, Mr. President. Undermined only by those opposite. Once we achieve 70 to 80 per cent vaccination, we'll see less transmission of COVID-19, fewer people with severe illness and less people in hospital and deaths. And we should all get Order, on. Order, Senator Colbeck. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Southwest and Western Sydney woke up yesterday to harsher restrictions and a Western Sydney Order. curfew as a result of a COVID-19 outbreak that started in Bondi. Why are Southwest and Western Sydney residents, who are trying to do the right thing by their community, being forced to take multiple buses and trains in the middle of a lockdown to get to a vaccination hub, and being forced to wait up to five hours outside at those vaccination hubs to get vaccinated? Senator Ban, what a disgrace. I remind senators on my right that during the question, I need to hear the question. Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you. Mr. President, can I say to all of those people in South West Sydney who are turning out Order. to get vaccinated, thank you for doing so. They know, Mr. President, those residents of South West Sydney know, like we know, that vaccination is one of the things that provides a pathway for all of us to deal with this pandemic, Mr. President. Mr. President, there are 700 and 77 primary care and Commonwealth sites administering vaccines across South West Sydney, Mr President. 777. 590 general practices, including 266 who are offering the Pfizer vaccine. Seven gen ge general practice respiratory clinics, 14 Aboriginal community health centres and 176 community pharmacies who are offering AstraZeneca, Mr President. 777 sites across South West Sydney. Order. Can I say to those Australians from South West Sydney, thank you for turning out. Thank you for having the patience to wait for your jab. You are doing not only yourselves a service but your community service because we know and you know that is those people of South West Sydney. They know that one of the pathways in dealing Order, with, this with this virus is to get vaccinated. It will protect you, it will protect your community, and it's once we start reaching the thresholds that have been set down by the national plan, it is the way that we start returning to a more normal life, Mr President. So thank you to all of those people in South West Sydney. In fact, thank you to all of those people around the country who are turning out to get vaccinated. And particularly, Mr President, thank you to those health workers who are working in those vaccination clinics, the GPs, the pharmacists, those working in the, the ARCHOs, those working in the um, uh, prime, uh, Commonwealth health sites and in the state clinics. All of those, Mr. President, Order, are working Senator to assist Colbeck, time people to get the vaccinated. answer has expired. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Why are pregnant women and children with disabilities in the federal electorate of MacArthur still having trouble booking vaccine appointments, as they're reporting to their local MP? 18 months into the pandemic and six months into the vaccination rollout. Order. On my right, Senator Colbeck. 
Well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Senator Keneally, for the question. Mr. President, clearly there is strong demand for vaccine across the country, uh, and that is only a good thing. Can I uh, say to all Australians? Order. Can I say to all Australians? Order. Mr. President, it's clear that there's only one group of people in this country who, have, who are campaigning against the vaccine rollout and who are undermining, Order. And who are undermining confidence in the vaccine rollout, Order. Mr. President. And it's them over there, Mr. President. It's that lot over there, Mr. President. We continue to increase the supply, Mr. President. And as I've already indicated today, we in continue to increase the number of outlets that are available for people to get a vaccine. And as more vaccine becomes available, we continue to increase the volume. And it's only the Labor Party who are out there trying to undermine confidence in the vaccine rollout. It's only the Labor Party who are out there trying to Order. undermine confidence in vaccines. Order. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Representing the constituents of people of what southwestern Western Sydney. 18 months into the pandemic, they're struggling to secure vaccine appointments. They're living in lockdown conditions worse than anything Australia has ever experienced. Why has the Morrison Joyce government left Senator the people Van. of South West and Western Sydney behind? Yeah. Senator Van, I've called you to order during questions on a couple of occasions now. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I completely and utterly reject the premise of the question, Mr. President. Order. Only last week, Mr. President, we put an extra 500,000 doses of Pfizer vaccine that we'd managed to bring in from overseas into New South Wales to assist with the current circumstance, Mr. President. We continue to work on vaccine supply and, and to increase the, the availability of vaccine, Mr. President and the number of outlets, as I've already outlined a number of times in the chamber today. While the Labor Party fight us, Mr President, we fight Order. the virus, Mr President. While the Labor Party fight us, we will continue to fight the virus and we will continue to work in the interests of Australians to give them access to vaccine. We appreciate the fact that they are lining up for we, we, we appreciate the fact that they are lining up for, a, for a, an appointment. We appreciate that they are turning out to get vaccinated. They know, like we do, that vaccination is a pathway Order, to Senator freedom. Senator Colbeck. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. There are a growing number of children, teenagers and young people sick with COVID. Do you acknowledge that including children in the vaccination targets will save lives? When will your government include kids under 16 in the national vaccination targets, and when will there be enough supply for those young people? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and uh, thanks, Senator Seward, for the question. Mr President, can I say I, I reject the assertion that there's any sense uh, on the behalf of the government that all parts of the Australian population aren't important in the vaccination rollout. Uh, the, pla the national plan for vaccination that was agreed by National Cabinet, uh, with modelling done by the Doherty Institute, was based on uh, a certain population cohort, uh, Mr. President, and based on at, the, at that point in time the, the, the information available to Doherty and to Australia with respect to approved vaccines, Mr. President. Mr. President. And I think it's also important that we, at this point, consider the impact of the virus on Australians and people within different cohorts, which reinforces, which reinforces our process, Mr President. So the, the, we've received approval for the administration of vaccines to uh, 12 to 15 year olds, uh, and, and we have commenced the process of rolling the vaccine process out to the most vulnerable of those. We have started that. We have said, Mr President, that when the advice from ATAGI comes to us, when the advice from the health professionals that are advising the government and guiding the vaccine rollout comes to us, then we will make the vaccine available to the rest of those cohorts, Mr President. And plans for that are already being developed. And they are important, Mr President. Mr. President, and, and, and if you look at the, the wording from the, the information from Doherty, 
They stand by their modelling. They stand by their modelling and the targets that have been established. And when you consider that there's 1.2 million children in Order, the cohort Senator that you're Colbeck, talking about, Order, Senator Colbeck. Time for the answers expired. Senator, see what a supplementary question. There are now, sorry, there are now a number of models on vaccination targets. Why are you only relying on the Doherty modelling? Isn't it, is it because it's politically convenient? Why did you limit the advice and the modelling from Doherty to over 16-year-olds? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, can I say um, at the outset, I think that's an outrageous thing for Senator Seward to say. The, the Doherty modelling um, is based on work across a number, number of peak institutions in this country. Uh, and, and Mr President, uh, I'll take your interjection, Senator. And if you, and if you, and if you look at, for example, the ANU, if you look at the ANU uh, modelling, for example, and look at the assumptions, which are seriously flawed, I have to say. Seriously flawed. No, I will tell you what's flawed about them. They assume that we go directly from A to D and, and, and skip sections uh, B and C in the national plan. That's the flaw, Mr President. So be careful about the modelling you're quoting and don't be a part of the Labor Party's process of undermining the modelling and the plan that we have for national um, uh, vaccination process. The children are important, Order, Mr. President. Senator Colbeck, children time are for the answer has expired. Senator Seawood, a final supplementary question. When will, a, when will the government stop enabling vaccine apartheid and finally support a TRIPS waiver? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, that, that is an absolutely outrageous slur. And quite frankly, Senator Seawood, through you, Mr. President, you should be ashamed of yourself. At no point, at no point, has the government tried to downplay the importance of any part of this Australian community. We have, at all times, sought to provide protection and support for all Australians, including children, Mr. President. And it's an outrageous order, slur. Senator. Senator Seawood, on your point of order is on. Point of order is on the fact that the minister didn't, is it on direct? didn't Senator, listen. Senator Seawitt, Sen no, Senator Seawitt, you asked a question that had highly. I asked about the trips. This waiver. is not a, yeah, Senator Seawitt. Yes, also, I did. I order. asked. Order on my right. Points of order have to relate to the standing orders. I'm going to at least ask people to treat the chamber with the courtesy of saying that it's to do with direct relevance. It's not a chance to restate the question, Senator Seawitt. You also used a highly charged term in that question, and I have ruled previously that where highly politically charged terminology is used, that ministers are entitled to respond, and that was a particularly loaded um, piece of terminology. So the minister is allowed to respond. I can't instruct him how to answer a question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. The government has at all times been concerned to ensure that all Australians are supported and protected through the management of the pandemic, Mr. President. Mr. President, and so in setting the thresholds under the national plan, the Doherty modelling takes into account the two-week time frame for people to get full immunisation and the later time for the vaccination of children, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, the Greens and Labor can come in here and run all the slurs they like against us, but we will continue to work in the interest of the Australian people to help them to get vaccinated and also Order. to support the Senator opening of Colbeck, the Australian time economy. For the answer has expired. Senator Griff, remotely. Uh, thank you, Mr President. But my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. Last week, the New South Wales government announced that 800 Australian soldiers would be deployed to help state police enforce movement restrictions. And the Queensland government announced 100 soldiers would be deployed to help state police enforce border restrictions. Can the minister tell us what reasonable and necessary force will be permitted for these personnel to carry out their duties, such as the power to make arrests or to use force against Australians? The minister representing the Minister for Defence, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Griff for his question. Uh, I can advise the senator that uh, the scope of ADF support to states and territories is constitutionally limited. 
uh, as I'm sure the Senator is aware, particularly for tasks with an element of law enforcement. ADF personnel are not authorised as law enforcement officers, nor are personnel able to enforce health orders. These remain the responsibility of relevant state or territory agencies. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Minister, what happens if something goes wrong on one of these patrols or door knocks and a member of the public gets violent or makes threats? In these circumstances, what powers do the ADF personnel have? Uh, and are they only able to follow directions of police officers or can they make their, uh, take actions on their own initiative? Senator Payne. Uh, Senator Griff, I, uh, through you, Mr. President, uh, to Senator Griff, uh, I would reiterate uh, what I said uh, in response to your first question, Senator, which is that the ADF are not authorised as law enforcement officers. The, law, the uh, authorisation for those uh, powers remains with the police of the relevant state or territory, uh, and these matters are determined. Uh, and planned and operationalised between the ADF and the relevant police service, whether it is in the examples you have used, Senator, New South Wales or in Queensland. Uh, and in fact, given the amount of time uh, since the beginning of Operation COVID Assist uh, in 2020, uh, where we have seen over 20,500 ADF personnel deployed nationally under Operation COVID-19 Assist. Uh, there has been uh, a very significant uh, period uh, for agencies to work together on exactly these matters. Senator Griff, a final supplementary question. Yes, thank you, Minister, for that explanation. Every Australian police force has hotlines and online reporting portals for members of the public to report um, you know, police uh, misconduct. How will Australians be able to report any misconduct of ADF personnel supporting law enforcement and who will investigate these reports? Senator Payne. Um, Senator Griff, uh, through you, Mr President, Senator Griff, uh, through, en through any normal channels in which one would, uh, would report such a, such a concern. Uh, but to be very clear, um, the scope is constitutionally limited and constitutionally limited, particularly with regard to tasks with an element of law enforcement. There is no authorisation for the ADF to act as law enforcement officers, uh, nor, uh, as I said previously, to enforce health orders. Uh, this remains the responsibility of those state and territory agencies. Uh, can I say in conclusion, Mr President, uh, to all of those uh, women and men in law enforcement agencies around Australia and to all of the women and men who have been deployed uh, with the ADF through Operation COVID Assist, that we recognise that these have been uh, very demanding, very challenging times in Australia, and we acknowledge their service and their contribution. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Following a visit to the Dubbo Aboriginal Medical Service in April this year, I wrote to the Minister for Health, alerting him to the chronic understaffing of GPs at the Dubbo Aboriginal Medical Service and the excessive delays that would have on the vaccine rollout to the Dubbo Indigenous community. Why did the Minister for Health do nothing to address the issues raised and potentially avert the current outbreak in Dubbo's Indigenous community? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator, for her question. Um, throughout the course of the pandemic, the, in, ensuring that um, Indigenous Australians had access to vaccine has been one of the important elements of the way that we've managed the program, Mr. President. They were in the early stages of having availability of vaccine. Um, like Senator O'Neill, the government is also concerned uh, around the vaccination rates in some parts of, of Australia and with the uh, a, a rising of so, uh, the outbreak, particularly in the region of Dubbo, the, uh, there's been a number of specific measures that have been undertaken, Mr President, to support Australians, particularly in that area, to get vaccinated. There's been five teams, Mr President, of ADF uh, vaccination uh, force go out there to work their way through the community to make sure that there was availability of vaccination for people in those communities. We're working our way methodically through those communities, Mr President, to ensure that we can get vaccination rates up to support and protect those communities, Mr President. And we will continue to Order, do that. Senator President. Colbeck, have you concluded your answer? 
Or, uh, sorry, I'm just saying, has Senator Colbert concluded his answer or I'll take the point of order? Senator Colbert? Oh, point of order. Sorry, Senator O'Neill. It is indeed a point of order with regard to relevance. I, I think um, I appreciate that the minister is speaking about the general scheme that ha has been advanced in the region, but my question is specifically for the AMS in Dubbo. It was a very specific question. There was a letter that was sent. Okay. This requires a specific answer. Order. I think I, the no, people of Dubbo I, I deserve take, that. Well, Senator O'Neill, please, I again ask people to make their point without commentary. Um, I take your point. It was a specific question, but as the minister was talking about programs that related to that region, there is an opportunity to debate the merit of answers after question time, but he is being directly relevant, even if not answering in the form that the asker would prefer. So I call the minister to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, and, and we continue to support uh, Indigenous communities around Australia with respect to vaccination. Uh, as of the 23rd of August, uh, 193,348 people who identify as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander had at least one dose of, of vaccine, approximately 33 per cent of the eligible uh, population. Uh, over 103,000, Mr President, uh, have received a second dose. Uh, the largest gaps uh, in coverage are seen in the 40 to 59-year-old age group. Approximately 75 per cent of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are aged 12 years and over and are eligible for COVID vaccines, Mr President. Um, we will continue to work cooperatively with New Order. South Wales Senator Colbert, and the time for The answer has expired. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that as at the 17th of August, the Morrison-Joyce government had vaccinated just 8 per cent of First Nation Australians in Western New South Wales? Why are the First Nation Australians being left unprotected by the Morrison-Joyce government? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I can't confirm the number quoted by the Senator. I don't have that granular level of detail here with me, with um, my information, Order. Mr. President. Order. Uh, Mr. President, as I've indicated, uh, in response to the outbreak in Western New South Wales, the government has taken some very specific actions to ensure Order. that. Vaccination capacity was increased in those regions as it needed to be, and as we've done across other parts of the country, Mr. President. We supported Victoria in their surge when they had an outbreak. We've supported New South Wales more broadly when they've had an outbreak, Mr. President. Uh, so there's a specific incident management team to coordinate the Commonwealth response, it includes representatives from the National Indigenous Australians Agency, uh, and they include, uh, of course, ac vaccine ac allocation. Uh, support from the Archers, support from the Royal Flying Doctor Service, the Australian De uh, Defence Force vaccination Order, schemes, Senator Colbeck, and of course PPE. Time for the answer has expired. Senator O'Neill, final supplementary question. Perhaps the minister might be able to take that on notice and confirm that 8% number. The Morrison Joyce government promised the First Nations Australians that they were a priority in the vaccine rollout and would be fully vaccinated by winter. We're now eight days away from spring. COVID-19 is ripping through First Nations communities. Why should Australians believe Mr Morrison will deliver on his new promises when he's failed to deliver on his old promises, leaving First Nations Australians unprotected and at risk? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thanks, Senator O'Neill, for the question. And I reject the premise of the question, completely reject the premise of the question. And in fact, uh, Senator O'Neill quite dishonestly didn't declare that Minister Hunt had actually responded to order. her on the 27th order. of July Senator on a point to of answer order. the question. Senator O'Neill on a point of order. I think, I think the honourable gentleman should withdraw that comment. Um, I, I'm happy to correct myself later on, but I don't believe those, that terminology has been ruled unparliamentary in the past. Um, and the clerk, I think, is agreeing with me. If I'm wrong, I'll come back and say so. Um, Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr President. As, as, as so often happens in this chamber, the opposition come in here to misrepresent quotes that have been made by members of parliament and don't fully declare the full circumstances that sit behind the questions. Order. Senator Keneally on a point of order. My point of order is relevance. Uh, the, the, 
Senator O'Neill did not say that Minister Hunt didn't respond. She said, and I quote, that the minister did nothing to address Senator, the Senator, issues Senator raised. Keneally, Senator Keneally, I, I Senator stand Keneally, by please, Senator O'Neill's call for that Senator comment Keneally, to be withdrawn. Senator Keneally, I'm going to insist that while the leaders are given a lot more room to move, they do abide by the chair when I call them to order. That wasn't even a remote attempt at a point of order, Senator Keneally. That was debating a matter of fact. There's a time for that after question time. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. So I reject the premise of Senator O'Neill's question. We have continued and we will continue to support all communities in Australia. As the response from Minister Hunt to Senator O'Neill clearly indicates, with a, a whole range of incentives and programs that are designed Order. to support Indigenous communities, uh, workforce incentives, rural bulk Order. building incentives, uh, distribution priority system to identify uh, distribution of GPs, Mr. President, a range of things in place to support Australians and particularly, Mr. President, Indigenous communities. Order, order, Senator McMahon. Order. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the Minister advise the Senate on what measures are available to support serving members of the Australian Defence Force experiencing emotional distress and anxiety, including in my hometown of Catherine and Darwin in the Northern Territory? The Minister representing the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. And, uh, I particularly thank Senator McMahon for this very important question because we are all very conscious that the devastating developments in Afghanistan are distressing for many of our serving defence personnel and for veterans, including particularly in the Northern Territory with its very large defence community. We thank, we acknowledge the 39,000 Australian men and women who served in Afghanistan and the many more Australians who have served in both campaigns and peacekeeping efforts around the world, including the Battle of Long Tan, uh, the 55th anniversary of which we marked last week. To all those who have worn an Australian military uniform, to all of their families, we are grateful for their sacrifices and for the safety and security that you have award afforded your fellow Australians. In turn, we have a duty as a nation to be there for them by ensuring their physical and mental health needs are met. And the government is committed to ensuring Australian Defence Force personnel have access to the right support at the right time. Defence has in place mental health services that operate around the clock. These include the confidential telephone support services for both ADF members and families, the Defence Employee Assistant Pro Assistance Program, which provides free professional counselling and support through Defence members' chains of command through the chaplaincy service. Defence provides comprehensive mental health support services to deployed forces uh, before and during and after deployments. Mr President, to all of those who served in Afghanistan, the government is unequivocal in saying that you did the job your nation asked of you. You did it overwhelmingly with great distinction and nothing will change that. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Um, can the minister advise what other measures are available to support ex-service men and women? Senator Payne. Thank you, uh, Mr President. And the government does operate a range of services for veterans, such as the Open Arms 24-7 Counselling Service and 1800 Veteran. And of course, our veterans community has generated an extraordinary depth of support over many years and more recently through groups like Legacy and the RSL, like Soldier On, like Wounded Heroes uh, and Young Veterans, to name a few. And I'm pleased to say that uh, many of our veteran women are playing increasingly important roles as well. Delissa Papamau, who served as an ADF medic in Afghanistan in 2012 and in Papua New Guinea in 2014, has founded Modern Soldier, an online veterans network that created a series of groundbreaking videos on post-traumatic stress disorder and now helps veteran-owned businesses to sell their products. The Women's Veterans Network Australia connects ex-serving women and fosters a sense of belonging and reduces isolation. I commend all of the women and men working to help Australia's veterans. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How is the Liberal and Nationals government working with ex-service organisations to ensure tailored support is available for all veterans who require it? Senator Payne. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And again, I thank Senator McMahon because I know that uh, Senator McMahon has a particular interest in this issue in the territory. Uh, the government recognises that military service creates special bonds between those who serve together, and these last for the rest of so many veterans' lives. Nothing can substitute for these bonds. So the very important thing that government can do is to nurture and support connections that the veterans have forged themselves. The Australian government is investing $40 million in a network of veteran wellbeing centres around Australia, one of which is in Darwin. I congratulate Senator McMahon on her support for the veteran community in the Northern Territory, and I hope to have the opportunity to visit the Darwin Veteran Wellbeing Centre in the future that's being led by Mates for Mates in collaboration with a number of local organisations, which will provide a one-stop shop of support services to veterans and their families. Senator Lambie, remotely. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Finance and Special Minister of State, Senator Birmingham. The electoral, the electoral legislation amendment party registration integrity bill 2021 would give political parties the right to block new parties coming through if they had the same key words as existing parties in their names. When the Liberal Party was formed in October 1944, there was already an existing political party called the Liberal Democratic Party. If the rules you want to put in place were around when, you, when your party started, there wouldn't actually be any Liberal senators in the building today. Does that seem fair to you, or do you think that would be good for democracy, to let incumbents block their opponents? The Minister for Finance, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Lambie for her question. Uh, we have uh, a robust democracy in Australia in which competition is, uh, is freely and fairly uh, encouraged, but needs to be freely and fairly encouraged in ways uh, that uh, ensure voters make informed choices, uh, have all of the information to make informed choices, uh, and that they are supported and empowered in their choices. And now, sometimes, Mr. President, uh, people will decide to go and start other political parties. Senator Lambie, indeed, is an example of that. But Senator Lambie has always made sure she stood very clearly, very identifiably in relation to her political parties, whether that was uh, as a Liberal Party member at one stage, whether it was uh, as a candidate and a senator uh, for Clive Palmer's party, uh, or whether indeed it is now very identifiably as the Jackie Lambie network. That's as it should be, Mr President clear, obvious to the voters. Uh, the practice that has been increasing in recent times of uh, some sort of political astroturfing uh, by some individuals uh, is unhelpful to voters, has been shown in terms of voting trends across some states to create confusion, especially when it comes to Senate voting tickets. Uh, so uh, yes, it is reasonable for political parties uh, to be able to have their name protected just like any other trademark has its name and brand protected uh, under legal practices. That's a common sense approach, and that's all that the government seeks to do, not to prohibit or to prevent anybody else from having the opportunity to contest an election vigorously, but also fairly, uh, and that's the intent of these laws. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. If this bill passes, small parties with small budgets have to get rid of any materials that they've already produced with their current names or logos and pay to replace them all. They have to pay to replace their websites. They have to build a whole new uh, brand in less than six months. We've been making any compensation to those parties who incurred approved political expenditure under the old rules, who will now have the exp that expenditure rendered redundant once Labor rolls over like a puppy dog and packs and backs your bill. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. And Mr. President, I'd make the point again. This is about simply ensuring that voters have clarity in their voting intentions in the choices before them. I note across the current Senate chamber, we have, as I said before, Senator Lambie and the Jackie Lambie network. We have Pauline Hanson's One Nation Party. We have Senator Griff uh, representing Centre Alliance. And Senator Patrick uh, as an independent, the Greens, the Labor Party, the Liberals, the Nationals. Each are clearly distinguishable from the other when their names are presented on the ballot paper. That's all we seek to achieve and to ensure occurs in the future. Uh, and we hope and trust uh, that all will see the common sense in that regard, that there's simply fair Sorry, approaches talk. being put in place Sorry. for our next election. Sorry. Point of order. Senator Lambie, a final supplementary question. 
Oh, sorry, oh, sorry, I was using a point of order there. Okay, no worries. Uh, um, Senator Lambie, just but I should say the rules for remote participation don't allow points oh, of order to be raised remotely. So my apologies. Okay, for the confusion. sorry. But your last question, sorry. Senator Lambie. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. The bill triples the membership requirements for parties effective immediately, and the minister, the minister says this is to test that political parties have genuine community support. So the obvious question here is. Isn't that what elections are for? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, indeed, elections don't prevent anybody uh, from nominating and from uh, standing. Uh, they can stand as an independent. That is an option open uh, to all Australians. Uh, but what we seek to ensure is that where people constitute a political party, uh, it has a genuine underpinning to it, and that a party is not just an independent, a party is about ensuring uh, that it has uh, a base, a body of support, a set of beliefs commonly adhered to by its members. That again is the logical common sense test that Australians apply uh, when they are thinking about what political parties are. Uh, and that is simply, uh, again, all that these uh, modest reforms seek to do uh, to ensure that we have that test in place in ways that meet the expectations of the Australian people, expecting political parties to be fair to income political parties and expecting the names of those parties to be clearly distinguished from one another, reflecting their individual identities. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr President. My question this afternoon is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. How many children with a disability in Australia have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19? Senator, the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. On the 2nd of August this year, Mr. President, the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation reviewed the data on safety and efficacy of the Pfizer vaccine and recommended that the following groups of children among those aged 12 to 15 years be prioritised for vaccination using Pfizer. Children with a specified medical condition that increase their risk of severe COVID-19, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children aged 12 to 15 years, all children aged 12 to 15 years in remote communities as a part of a broader outreach vaccination program that provide vaccinations for all ages uh, greater than 12 years. The government is also ensuring that all children accessing or eligible to access the National Disability Scheme will have access to the Pfizer vaccine from Wednesday the 25th of August if they have not already had their vaccine. Mr. President. Uh, so as the medical advice and as the vaccines have become registered for use in children, we have followed that advice um, and made the vaccine available from Monday the 9th of August. Mr. President, the, the Pfizer vaccine has been opened for those with those underlying medical conditions. Uh, and as I've indicated earlier, once a target provides to us. Order, Senator Colbeck. Uh, Senator Watt on a point of order. Senator Watt. Um, to, on relevance, the, the question simply asked for a number. If the minister doesn't have the number, he should uh, agree to bring it back and take it on notice. Well, I can't instruct the minister how to answer or address a question. Um, I will say that the minister has been speaking for 90 seconds and it was a question that was very specific in nature. So I'll ask the minister to turn to the question. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. As I indicated to the chamber, on a target's advice from the Monday the 9th of August, so only earlier this month, was the Pfizer vaccine made available to children in that age cohort. So, Mr. President, the question as to those that have been fully vaccinated, Mr. President, I actually don't have the data on. Uh, but given the, but given, Mr. President, and we need to consider the, the process for commencement. Order, whether Senator the data Colbeck, actually exists, time for the answer has time. expired. Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. How many students and staff for children with disabilities have been fully vaccinated? at schools for children with disability. Senator Colbeck. Mr President, again, um, <laughs> the, the vaccination of students 
with any vaccine in this country has only commenced since the 9th of August this year. Uh, that data is not yet available for people who are fully vaccinated, Mr. President, because, Mr. President, three weeks hasn't passed for a full cycle of vaccination yet. So, Mr. President, it's very, very cute for the Labor Party to come in here and ask that sort of question. But when based, but when based on the medical advice, we've commenced and made available the vaccine as soon as it was approved for use and supported by the medical authorities, Mr. President, we will be able to provide the, the data once it's collected, once the full vaccine cycles have been completed, Mr. President. And with respect to staff, I'm very happy to provide that information to the chamber as, as I can make it available. Senator Pratt, a final supplementary question. Why has the Morrison government failed to track the number of children with disabilities and staff at their schools who are being vaccinated? when people with learning disabilities have been seen to be eight times more likely to die from COVID than the general population. Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, again, the Labor Party come in here and uh, make an allegation that simply isn't true. Uh, there is a whole range of data that's being uh, provided, supported uh, and tracked. Uh, and as, as I've indicated to the chamber, the vaccination of children the vaccination of children has only been available since the 9th of August this year, Mr. President. 9th of August this year, not a full vaccination cycle of three weeks yet has passed. So for the Labor Party to come in here and ask Order. and infer that the data is not available Order. is quite frankly dishonest, Mr. President, because they know it can't have been made available yet because it can't be collected yet because the time frames for collecting it haven't occurred yet, Mr. President. Every single, every single member of the Australian community is important to this government, and it's Order. only the Labor Senator Party Colbert, campaigning against the, the government while we support has expired. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Minister Cash. With this week being the 11th National Skills Week, can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's skill reform agenda has strengthened our vocational education system? The minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I thank Senator Small for the question. Uh, and in answering the question, I do acknowledge that Senator Small, as an employer, uh, and as an employer in the hospitality industry back in Western Australia. Uh, Senator Small is one of those people who has had the opportunity to provide young people with the opportunity to undertake a traineeship in his workplace and to actually provide them with that stepping stone and those skills that they need to get into the hospitality industry. And Mr President, as Senator Small stated this, year, this week, uh, it is the 11th National Skills Week. Uh, and as we know, National Skills Week is dedicated to raising the profile and the status of vocational education and training within Australia, but also looking at dispelling myths and showcasing the, in particular, attractive career opportunities that someone with a vocational education and training skill set is able to get. Mr President, we need to acknowledge that vocational education and training it has well and truly been the foundation of Australia's strong and vibrant economy. And when you look at so many who have been through vocational education and training in Australia, it has produced industry leaders, it offers great diversity, it offers new and exciting career paths, it supports our resources and primary industries. It builds our cities, it supports tourism, it supports monuments, it supports our heritage, and as Senator Small knows, it well and truly supports our hospitality industry uh, within Australia. And each week, we have the opportunity as a country to really get together and highlight all of these opportunities. Uh, I know the Morrison government is proud uh, to recognise National Skills Week in 2021. In terms of our commitment, to Australians in the vocational education and training sector. We have invested a record $6.4 billion in skills in this financial year alone. $6.4 billion has been invested by the Morrison Order. government. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Minister, 
How are the Morrison government's wage subsidies supporting Australian businesses to take on an apprentice or trainee and help meet the skills needs of Australia's workforce now and into the future? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, so many employers across Australia know that the Morrison government is backing them to take on a new apprentice or trainee into their business. And of course, last year we announced the Boosting Apprenticeship Commitments Wage Subsidy. And what that has now done, Mr President, across Australia is it has actually seen apprenticeship and traineeship numbers increase by colleagues 200,000. We have put in a place a policy that has given 200,000 new commencements across Australia. This is 200,000 Australians who are now in an apprenticeship or a traineeship as a result of the Morrison government's boosting apprenticeship and commencement wage subsidy. And Mr President, that really does say something for the fact that employers out there, they are utilising the policies that the Morrison government puts in place to bring new apprentices and new trainees into their business. Senator Small, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. How is the Morrison government's economic recovery plan helping Australians train for the skills that we need now and as we chart our way back from the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as we know, the coalition government, the Morrison government, we've been working with the states and territories uh, in particular to provide additional training places in areas of skills demand. And that is the key to the success of the Job Trainer Program, $500 million from the Morrison government and $500 million matched by the states and territories. But the key to the additional training places that we actually released onto the market were that they are within areas where there are skills demands. So we are training people across Australia, working with the states and territories through what is now a $2 billion job trainer fund to ensure that Australians, when they access job trainer, are training up in areas of actual labour market demand. That's because we understand we need to put in place those policies which will skill up Australians and give them the skills they need to get into a job. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Mr Morrison has failed to deliver on his promise to vaccinate all people working and living in residential aged care by Easter, vaccinate all Australians with a disability and disability care workers by Easter, vaccinate four million Australians by the end of March, fully vaccinate all over 70s by the onset of winter, and vaccinate all Australians by October. Why should Australians believe Mr Morrison will deliver on his new promises when he has consistently failed to deliver on his old promises, leaving Australians languishing in lockdown? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, once again, Senator Watt and his questions has become commonplace from the Labor Party. And airbrush the bits of history that they're not interested in. Uh, they simply ignore the realities of the 3.4 million doses that didn't arrive on schedule at the start of the year. They airbrush the challenges in relation to changes in the health advice that related to the AstraZeneca vaccine. They pretend those things didn't occur and just suit on uh, pursuing the politically motivated agenda. Well, that's the choice of the Labor Party, Mr President. Uh, but what we've acknowledged is there have been challenges. We've taken responsibility for fixing those challenges and we are pleased, Mr President, to see the rate of the vaccine rollout now charging ahead across Australia. In the last week alone, 1.8 million doses administered uh, around Australia. That is the population of South Australia provided with a vaccine dose all in one week, running at a rate of administration of vaccines now higher than was ever achieved in the United States at their peak higher than was ever achieved in the United Kingdom at their peak. Order. And that's before we see the increase in supply that will come through further in the coming months. We've secured additional supply already, and there's more coming. It will see with that extra supply, even more distribution outlets brought online. The ability for us to open up at that point to the entire adult population, providing all Australians with the opportunity to follow the magnificent lead of our older and senior Australians who have turned out as the first cohorts made eligible in record numbers, taking the effort, taking the time to get vaccinated uh, now some 85% plus in first dose 
uh, for the most senior Australians, setting a very strong example that I trust based on the growth rates we're seeing across every other age cohort will be followed by Australians to help us reach the crucial targets of 70 and 80 per cent and hopefully further uh, in the time to come. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Mr Morrison is promising Australians that the lockdowns he is responsible for will end when 70 per cent of Australians over the age of 16 are vaccinated. Will Mr Morrison admit that Australia would be there already if he had not failed his two jobs on vaccine and quarantine? How can Australians trust that the same man who got them into this mess can get them out of it? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Well, there we have Labor again taking the political approach. There we have Senator Watt repeating this pathetic line from Labor like there are only two jobs to worry about. Well, of course, there are many more serious jobs in addition to COVID that we must Order. do simultaneously, have been pursuing simultaneously, whether that be the updated Closing the Gap agenda, whether that be dealing with the sensitive issues in Afghanistan, whether that be pursuit of many other policies in relation to economic growth, to climate change or otherwise. But in terms of the agenda to opening up, we are absolutely committed to seeing the Doherty modelling applied because it provides a scientific basis to give confidence, certainty to Australians while keeping Australians as safe as possible. We can Order. see Australia charging towards those targets in the Doherty modelling because Australians are turning out as the dosages become more available, and that is delivering the opportunity for us to look to a future with far more confidence and optimism than those on the other side apparently seem to have. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. In the Black Summer bushfires, Mr Morrison told Australians, I don't hold a hose, mate. And when COVID hit Australia, Mr Morrison blamed everyone else for his failure to deliver safe national quarantine and the vaccine rollout. After three years as Prime Minister, when will Mr Morrison start acting like one? Senator Birmingham. Well, what a pathetic excuse for a question there from Senator Watt. Indeed, as a government, and we are proud to have Mr Morrison leading us, uh, leading us through the most uncertain of global times. We're proud of the fact that as a country, the cooperation shown by all Australians right across this nation has ensured that despite our current difficulties, we do have world-leading outcomes when it has come to the management of COVID-19. The policies and approaches put in place in Australia have saved lives, tens of thousands of lives compared with the rest of the world. The economic responses put in place in Australia have saved businesses and saved jobs, hundreds of thousands of jobs relative to the challenges that have been faced in the rest of the world. These are uncertain times. The Delta variant has thrown additional challenges at us. But we are confident Australia will come through it. And we won't let those opposite talk this nation down, talk it into some sort of economic abyss, because what we will see once again, I am certain, is that with the economic support Order. effectively Senator delivered, Birmingham, Australia time will for come the back strong. expired. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. And I ask that further questions be now placed on notice. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much. Um, I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Birmingham to the question asked by Senator Watt. My home state of New South Wales now is entering its ninth week of lockdown with record case numbers and a population suffering from nine weeks of social isolation from friends, families and everyday activities. There was one person, one person who could have stopped this had he been effective and had he kept his promises to the Australian people. But Mr Morrison instead has failed on all of those promises. His promise to vaccinate all people working and living in residential aged care by Easter. What Australians actually got? More than 40 per cent of aged care staff still haven't had their first shot, despite making vaccines mandatory in the aged care sector by the 17th of September. The government's failed rollout means that these aged care workers and the aged care sector will see them sacked, a large section of the workforce, or push back their deadline again to complete and utter failure. Mr. Morrison's second promise 
to vaccinate all Australians with a disability and disability care workers by Easter. What Australians actually got from Mr Morrison, 26.2 per cent of 267,526 national disability insurance scheme participants aged 16 or older have been double dosed and 44 per cent partially vaccinated as of August 19. That is another appalling failure to vaccinate our most at-risk citizens. Mr Morrison's third promise, to vaccinate 4 million Australians by the end of March. But what Australians actually got? 850,000 doses. Not full vaccines, doses. By April 6, just over 10 per cent of where we should have been in April. Mr Morrison's fourth promise to fully vaccinate all over 70s by the onset of winter. What seniors actually got? Fewer than 40 per cent of over 70s were fully vaccinated by the end of the second month of winter. And Mr Morrison's fifth promise to the Australian people to vaccinate all Australians by October. What Australia actually got was one of the slowest rollouts in the developed world. Chron chronic, crushing lockdowns, and as at yesterday, only 24 per cent of our population is fully vaccinated. Now, these failures, these broken promises from Mr Morrison have implications that have radically changed the lives of those in my home state. We will look back on this period of time, life before COVID and life after. And the endurance of the ongoing failure of this government during this profoundly challenging period for our country where promises were made and Mr Morrison and his government failed to deliver. Whether that's for the residents of South West Sydney who are locked in their homes with soldiers patrolling their streets, whether it's the aged care worker desperate, desperate to get a vaccine and an appointment trying to get there in time so that they don't infect the beloved um, members of that community that they're serving, or whether it's the First Nations communities whose communal lives and culture is profoundly interrupted by the terrifying spread of virus, especially those communities in Dubbo, for whom I advocated directly to the Minister for Health in April, who failed to respond, and we see the context in which this widespread of that disease is happening right now. I warned the government. I warned the government. Labor has continued to warn the government, particularly about rural health failures that would harm the lives of First Nation communities across this country, but particularly in the seat of parts in western New South Wales. Mr Morrison's fingerprints are all over this enormous mess, from the botched negotiations with Pfizer due to his meanness, offered 40 million doses in June 2020, and he said, no, thank you. We are paying the price for that decision. The lack of foresight, throwing all of our eggs into one vaccine basket, and the inability to effectively coordinate the rollout. This Prime Minister has hobbled the Australian economy, prolonged this terrible health crisis with his failure to attend to detail and to take necessary care. His sole interest, his political future, not the nation he pretends to lead, have left Australians in an enduring economic emotional health crisis, the likes of which thank we have you, never Senator seen. Thank you, Senator O'Neill. Your time has expired. Senator Bragg. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. Well, I rise to address the topic at hand this afternoon in the Senate, which is on the question of vaccines and the question of the management of this pandemic. Uh, now, um, it has been said uh, that the opposition uh, really has played uh, their, their role that we would expect during this past 18 months. They have been in opposition, interested in politics, not interested in trying to help the Australian nation uh, deal with an enormous economic and health shock. And so people want to talk about what really matters. Uh, when, the, when the books are written, people will look at this period and they will say that there was a relatively low level of infection, uh, there were fewer deaths than any other comparable nation the vaccine rollout was slower than it may have needed to be, uh, but it picked up pace uh, pretty quickly. Now, the pace of the vaccination rollout right now in my home state of New South Wales, and you want to talk about New South Wales, is pretty much the fastest in the world. 
It's the fastest that anyone's ever seen. Um, and we are now at the stage today, having hit six million doses in my home state, uh, which is almost 60 per cent of people having had one a dose, we're 15 points ahead um, of some of the other states in Australia. So New South Wales uh, will be the first to real freedom. I mean, other states can live behind their COVID curtain and try and pretend that they want to be in some sort of a hermit kingdom. Uh, but New South Wales, because of uh, the very fast rollout, uh, which is a combination of uh, Commonwealth and state government cooperation, will be the first to real freedom. The people in my state uh, will be the first people in this country to genuinely live with COVID. And that is what we have to do. We have to live with this. Now, now, now I must come to this issue that was raised during question time, where it was asserted that there was huge waits, huge waiting lists for, for people to get vaccines in South West Sydney. Well, helpfully, during the course of the last hour, I've been able to check, check a few facts. And I have spoken to some pharmacists that I know in South West Sydney. Uh, and you can walk into a pharmacy in Bexley or Kingsgrove and you can get it, you can get a shot straight away. So, I mean, Labor will want to pick up on the politics because they're not interested in health outcomes. They're interested in politics. And that is, and that is their role. So we can't begrudge them that. But, but the point is, um, we are on the way to achieving our plans targets. We're going to get to 70%. We're going to get to 80%. It is going to happen. You can already see with the older Australians... Um, in some cases having received um, over 80 per cent already of their first dose, this is going to happen. And in a couple of months, we're going to be there and um, our economic figures will still be very strong based on all the relevant data we have up to the moment. And people will look at this period and say, it was a huge economic shock, it was a huge health scare, but you know what, it was run, it was run pretty well because few people died, there were a low level uh, of infection, and the vaccine rollout was very fast uh, in the end. And, and so I think it's important when we, when we look at some of the more sensitive issues here around minorities uh, and people want to talk about the, the, the Indigenous communities. Uh, of course people are concerned about the Indigenous communities and in far-flung far and remote communities, and there are some of those in New South Wales, as there are in Western Australia, it has been very important to keep the virus out of these communities. And overall... Um, that has largely happened. Yes, there has been some infection in towns like Burke and Brewarrina and Canamble, towns that I visited in my role as a senator. And yes, it is clear that the facilities in those towns, uh, they're not flash facilities. And these are the last places we want to see the virus. Uh, but we do need now, um, having had the virus in some of these communities, to work closely with the, the elders, uh, as is happening, to ensure that those vaccines go into the arms of those Indigenous people. Now, you know, we do need to, um, I think, reflect on some of the, the past failures here on Indigenous policy in Australia, where there has been far too much paternalism and far too much um, doing to rather than, than doing with. And, that is, and that, is, that is what has happened across Australia uh, during this pandemic. The, the COVID rollout, the, sorry, the vaccination rollout um, has been done in consultation in deep consultation with the Indigenous community. So we need to get those vaccines into the arms in Western and Central Western New South Wales. Uh, that is happening uh, and that is now urgent. And so I think ultimately we will look back on this period as being a period of, of great, great um, concern. Um, there has been a big price paid by small business people and by the kids at schools, but ultimately we are on track and this will be over in a couple of months and we can open up. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Your time has expired. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the question from Senator Watt to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham, on the Morrison government's failure to hit their own self-imposed vaccine targets and to vaccinate key vulnerable groups in the community. This is a government, Deputy President, that is now in its eighth, eighth year. One only needs to look at some members of Cabinet to realise that sometimes the length of government is directly relevant to who in the B team gets into Cabinet. No more so is this true than of the Minister responsible for the dignity and peace of mind of hundreds of thousands of people with disabilities, Senator Reynolds. People with a disability and their loved ones depend on a capable, empathetic and engaged Minister. Instead, they've been saddled with the self-absorbed Senator of Western Australia who has failed in her current position 
and who is oh, clearly sorry, still Senator following Senator Small. Um, Senator Kitching, please. Um, there's a point of order. Senator Small. Uh, Madam Deputy President, that is a clear reflection on the minister in a personal capacity, and I consider a breach of 1933. Uh, no, thank you, Senator Small. It's not a reflection. Thank you. Uh, I, mean, I, realise, I realise, Deputy President, that of course Senator Small is also a senator for Western Australia, and I don't wish to besmirch him because he isn't uh, as self-absorbed as Senator Reynolds is. Um, anyway, she's currently failed in her in her position. She's um, still Senator in self pity. Senator Kitching, just a moment, please. Senator Small. So, if the previous thing wasn't a reflection, surely calling her self-absorbed certainly is. Uh, I don't believe it is, Senator Small. Thank you, Senator Kitching. She's still clearly wallowing in self pity, having been pried from her previous role as Defence Minister. In fact, you can probably still see the fingernail claw marks in the wall of the secure room from where they had to drag her out. And let me break it to you, Senator Reynolds, you're not getting that role back anytime soon. To add insult to injury, this is the second incompetent, inept and lazy minister that Australians with disabilities and their families and loved ones have had foisted upon them by the Prime Minister. They've gone from the member for Fadden to the Senator for Western Australia, Senator Reynolds. While her predecessor's sole qualification was that he is the Prime Minister's flatmate, I laughed disbelievingly this morning when I heard this pathetic and negligent minister boast about what she believes are her achievements and strengths on Radio National this morning. The minister said, and I quote, well, Fran, when I became minister nearly five months ago, it was very clear to me that there was a number of challenges in rolling out the vaccination program. I mean, one would think that she had some ability to see some problems um, to people with serious and permanent disability, particularly those in shared residential accommodation over 6,000 small homes around the nation, and that's for a variety of reasons. Everything from consent to making sure that we provide the right environment, the right supports to the individuals. And then Minister Reynolds went on to say, and this is why I really couldn't believe she said this, as an army logistician myself, I did what a good logistician did. How much are the tickets, one has to ask. I got an even better logistician to come in and set up a task force for disability vaccinations. This panicked buffoon actually said logistician, and I'll come back to that. She then went into an indecipherable bureaucratic rant in which she said, and I quote, now, as you've said in relation to all NDIS participants who are eligible, we've also had a 300% increase since I've started with this new approach in June. So we've still got a long way to go, but we've been picking that up fast. And I also finally just share with you that disability workers, we've had an extraordinary response. In fact, since you and I last spoke about the worker vaccination in June, we've had a 200% increase. So dreadful were these numbers, Deputy President, that she kept referring to a percentage increase and not the percentage of those actually vaccinated. So if we want to look at the actual figures, it's 28% months. That is it. Remember this minister talking about how she cares for people with disability? What an honour it was to be in this portfolio, she said. Fine words, zero action, zero action. Her responses on the ABC this morning and her dislike of discussing numbers would suggest that she's not even the logistician that she prides herself on being. And as she should remember, as she's already experienced, pride cometh before a fall. This train wreck of an interview shows she's not even a good obfuscator, an attribute much valued by this government. However, this isn't the only area in which the minister's reign of error is being felt. I received an answer to a question on notice today number 3926, whereby the minister revealed that complaints received by both Centrelink and Medicare, both under her watch, have steadily increased in recent months. We hear a lot about the Prime Minister shirking responsibility and not doing his job, but I'd like to add one more job to the list of things Mr Morrison will no doubt fail to do, and that is to sack this disgraceful dud before even more people die on his government's watch. So this is a message for the Prime Minister, one he'd heed if he was doing his job. He would not have this minister who's been in for 148 days subjecting cruelly people to a disability to her bungling, but he would get a better minister if that's what he really cared about. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Kitching. And I would ask you to withdraw those last comments you made about the minister. Um, I withdraw. Thank you, Senator Small. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And we know that the Leader of the Opposition in the other place 
Uh, the member for Grainler likes a buck each way, but it's come to today instead for the member for Maribyrnong and the former leader of the opposition, Mr Bill Shorten, to finally recognise that Labor can't have it each way when it comes to the Team Australia moment that is getting our nation vaccinated against COVID-19. Today, the member for Maribyrnong has uh, endorsed the government's position on adopting the National Cabinet endorsed Doherty Institute modelling, and that is that Australia must vaccinate and then, in a compact with the Australian people, must allow them to live with COVID-19. Not a, a, there is only one uh, contagious disease that has been eliminated from the face of the earth in the last 200 years. So it is fanciful to suggest that anything other than a suppression and vaccination strategy, and that is the strategy of the Morrison government and indeed the National Cabinet, gets Australians back to what they'd want. It gets them back living their lives. It gets them out from under the blanket, Mr. Oh, sorry, Mrs. Uh, Deputy President, and allows them to spend the time doing the sorts of things that we know they want to, and that's to get a job to raise their kids, to give them opportunities that might, they might not have had themselves. That is the Australia that the Morrison government wants to see, and that is what our track record speaks to. Not only will we be the first nation in the world to close our international border, we then set about protecting lives and livelihoods, uh, including, of course, uh, the devastating economic impacts of COVID-19 in the early days and the record levels of economic stimulus that we provided on the back of that, some $290 billion of direct economic stimulus that allowed three million Australians to be supported with JobKeeper and some million uh, to regain employment as the economy came roaring back. However, we are not done because we know that the vaccination program and the vaccination rollout is the key to a post-COVID normal for this country. And that's why in just seven days we've seen more than the population of South Australia vaccinated in the last week alone. Now, whilst those opposites seek to undermine uh, our vaccination effort, that is per capita a higher rate of vaccination than that that has ever been achieved by the United States or the United Kingdom on a per capita basis. They seek to undermine Australia's vaccination program, uh, which featured ordinary approvals of vaccines rather than emergency approvals of vaccines in the US and the UK. We know that the reason that the US and the UK did put their vaccines through emergency approval was because bodies were piling up in the streets. Instead, here in Australia, not only did we preserve the national economy with Australia's unemployment rate falling below 5 per cent in the latest monthly figures. But we did so with a death rate, uh, some uh, uh, lowest in the OECD, comparable with that of only New Zealand, uh, and one that would have otherwise meant some 30,000 additional deaths here in Australia, even if we'd only suffered the average death rate in the OECD. And yet do we hear a good word from those opposite about our vaccination program, about our economic support, about our national leadership through this once in a century pandemic. No, we don't. Other than from the member from Maribyrnong, who has finally realised that the time has come not to be painted into a corner here, isolated from the rest of the nation, as we seek to get the job done, get vaccinated and get back to living our best lives. Instead, this Labor Party has shown why in the eight long years that they have sat opposite, they learn nothing about their failures in government, where their uh, ill-thought-out uh, proposal for some $300 bonuses for vaccination was reminiscent of cash for clunkers, school halls, pink backs and other government rorts with your taxpayer money. Not only do they not learn from those failures in government, but they have learned nothing in the eight years of opposition sitting over there where they should have been listening to the Australian people who overwhelmingly speak with their sleeves, Madam Deputy President, and they are rolling their sleeves up in record numbers. When it comes to those uh, over 70, some 85 per cent already protected, 75 uh, per cent of the over 50s protected. When it comes to Australia's most vulnerable, we know that 67 per cent of those in shared disability accommodation have received one dose and already 51.9 per cent two doses. That 
is the fact, Madam Thank Deputy you, President. Senator Small. Your time has expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, well, look, Australians are typically known for being a rather easygoing lot. You know, we're not the ones to expect a great deal. We're relaxed, and I think it'd be fair to say we're reasonably forgiving types. And given these generally low expectations from Australians for most things, it is really quite something to see the level of disappointment currently in the community, especially against those opposite and their ability, or rather the lack of ability, inability, one might even say, to get on with the job and delivering on the things that matter to working families. Now, at the beginning of this year, we knew that the government had two jobs. First, it was to deliver the vaccine rollout, and the second was to deliver a national quarantine system. You know, and those opposite would like to talk about how great they are at this moment. But, you know, nine months later on, what we are seeing is the government playing catch up, to be frank. And given the whole year we've had uh, and the one previously, one would have thought that the government would throw absolutely everything at these tasks. One would have thought that the government would understand just how important it was for them just to get it right and getting those jabs in arms and having Australians overseas back home with their loved ones. And yet here we are with still some of the lowest vaccination rates in the developed world. About how quickly we're going, we will have some of the lowest vaccination rates in the developed world and still no effective quarantine system for returning Australians. As much as those opposite would like to ignore it, the Prime Minister and his government made some very promises to the Australian people. We remember those promises and so do those in our community. The coalition promised that stranded Australians would be home by Christmas. Last Christmas, that is. The coalition promised that in the race to get vaccinated, that Australians were at the front of the queue, that they would be the first ones, first in the line, to get those jabs that they needed to get our nation and our economy back on track. But what we know now is that both of these promises have been broken. Christmas came and it went, and still tens of thousands of Australians remain stranded overseas separated from family from friends <coughs> mothers and fathers sons and daughters husbands and wives torn apart because of this government's failure now eight months on from the commitment still here we are with loved ones torn away from their homeland because of this government's failure to deliver a national quarantine system and here we still are over 12 months on with australians waiting and waiting for the jabs that they desperately need and it is good to see, finally, the government playing catch up, but we're having to also rely on vaccines from overseas countries because we just took it too slow, too slow to get our orders in with various vaccination companies. Now we have half a, sorry, we have half a nation that is currently under lockdown, our two biggest cities in Australia, and even our national capital. Residents of Sydney and Melbourne are living under curfew conditions, all because of the coalition's failure. If Australians had access to the jabs they needed, we wouldn't be in this mess. That's just the fact of it. If Australia was actually at the front of the queue, like that was promised, we wouldn't be in this situation. It has been absolutely clear that the only thing this government deals in is false hope. It certainly isn't in outcomes. It's certainly not a result of orientated groups of individuals. And my question to the federal government is simply this. How much longer do we all need to wait here until you stop buck passing to the states and address the Commonwealth's failures, the Commonwealth's responsibilities under the Constitution? How much longer will working families be facing the uncertainty of rolling lockdowns before you'll get the jabs you promised? rolling out in their neighbourhoods? How much longer will this take? These are questions not asked by me, but these are questions that come to my office every single day from people, people who can't get work, people who are desperate to get out there and make it and earn a living. These are questions just far too important to ignore. They're too important for you to continue to buck pass on. I urge the government to step up to the plate, make good on your broken promises and do the job that you were elected to do. 
Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator O'Neill to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seward. I move to take note of the answers from Senator Colbeck to my questions on uh, vaccinations, mm -hmm. um, which he didn't answer. He didn't answer the question about uh, are children going to be uh, included in targets. And now this is a, a very, very important issue, because if children under the age of 16 are not included in our targets, it means that 80 per cent is really 65 per cent of the population. So that has ramifications in and of itself about the impact of COVID in the community, both in terms of the infection rate, in terms of people that catch it, and unfortunately in terms of deaths from COVID. But of course, importantly, we need to stop our children getting sick. It's absolutely essential that we move strongly to make sure that children under the age, teenagers under the age of 16 are included in our vaccination targets. Because we've seen from the latest outbreaks that children are getting the Delta variant. It is absolutely essential. I'm going to share my time with Senator Faruqi because she wants to talk about the WIPs, the TRIPS waiver. I asked, my last question was about the TRIPS waiver. The minister obviously did not understand the question because he went on and had a rant at me about the, my comment. It was not about Australia. It was about the TRIPS waiver so that other countries get access to vaccines. In other words, waiving intellectual property rights so that other countries, those lower GDP countries who don't have adequate access to vaccines, can get, vac uh, can get access to vaccines. That was that, what that question was about. Um, it was not about Australia. My other two were, but that one was about vaccines around the rest of the world. And the, this government, our government, the Australian government, has not supported the TRIPS waiver. It's one of those countries that is standing in the way of, uh, of making sure that TRIPS waiver is in place. I would like to now hand over the rest of my time to Senator Faruqi. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Deputy President. The Morrison government has not only botched up vaccinations for people living in, in this country, they are also actively jeopardising the health and lives of millions of people in this global south. The Liberal National Government has ignored the pleas of more than 100 countries for our support to temporarily lift intellectual property restrictions so poorer countries can manufacture vital vaccines, medicines, masks and ventilators. This waiver is currently being considered at the World Trade Organization with the TRIPS Council meeting again on September 14. But as Senator Seward said, I don't think the minister, Minister Colbeck, Colbeck even knows what a TRIPS waiver is. And that is pathetic <laughs> and shameful. Till now, Australia has sided with the big pharmaceutical corporations to keep their profits intact rather than increasing access to a life-saving treatment for people who have already been screwed over by the global north colonialism and neo-colonialism. Now is the time to pay off some of the debt that we owe these countries and their people by making sure that they can produce vaccines at the scale and urgency that is needed. Yet this government has not only stonewalled pleas to support the TRIPS waiver, but as the Saturday paper recently reported, they're using pharmaceutical industry talking points to help other holdouts such as Germany prolong negotiations at the World Trade Organizations. This government is so shamelessly supporting corporate profit ahead of the lives of people. And while refusing to support the TRIPS waiver on the one hand, on the other hand, Scott Morrison has dipped into the COVAX supply, taking out 500,000 Pfizer doses because he failed to do his job. COVAX, a donation-based model for access to vaccines to poorer countries, is already struggling to meet its funding goal and is not enough to meet the required demand. So today I'm calling on the Australian government again. If you have a skerrick of decency, any sense of morality and responsibility left in you to value people's lives, provide your full-throated support to the TRIPS waiver now. There is not a second to wait. Wait, it is unconscionable to deny any country vaccine access to protect the billions of dollars of profits of pharmaceutical giants. 
question is, motion moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices?